comes to mind when you hear the word migration? Now, if it's feathery birds up in the sky, then I think you're probably in the wrong place. But if hearing migration makes you think of data, the cloud, and upgrading your IT infrastructure, then you, my friend, are in the right place. I'm your host, Mark Jeffries, and in this episode of LBTV, we're going to talk about migrating load balancers to VMware. Migrating application workloads to a more modern, scalable infrastructure may seem like a daunting task, but it doesn't have to be. As customers consider their migration plans, they may conclude it doesn't have to be a rip and replace of the old legacy infrastructure and configuration. It can get stood up side by side and migrated with time. Now, to make migration easier, Arvi went ahead and built in an F5 migration tool. So the big question is, how does this migration tool help? So the migration tool is great because it does take the config, migrates it to an Avi config, and there's 200,000 lines of code that's now been popped over and converted. So we're converting it from like a big IP.conf, and we can do this from other products as well, like a Cisco or Netscaler, et cetera. We migrate that over into Avi, it migrates it into a JSON file, which is the Avi config file. We can then, later on, we can then take that and load that. And we do a couple things specifically with this. When you do just directly just copy it over and load it up, we load it up with all of the virtual services in a disabled state. And we do that because when they're disabled, they can be configured, they can be altered, changed, et cetera, but we haven't pushed them out to a service engine, meaning that the configuration exists on the controller, it's loaded, you can modify and play with it in the UI, but we're not going to cause a duplicate ARP storm or anything like that with, uh, because it may still be live on the F5. So that way we can do that migration when you're already. A couple of the things though that it does is that um, when you run through and do this, it outputs a couple of different files. One of this, the first of which is the Avi config itself, which is that JSON. But uh, give me a chance to share here. It also outputs a couple of other files. One of which is this uh, CSV or Excel file. And then what it's doing is it's saying, when I did this conversion, here's all of the objects that I found. Here's all the objects that I converted. Some objects like these virtual services successfully converted, some partially converted. And then it gives all reasons as to why I wasn't able to convert these. When considering migration, many customers may question, what about all of my I rules? How do they convert or migrate over? Well, let's see how RV tackled the long list of I rules and built in technology to simplify your configurations. When we started RV, we just took a look and said, here's a list of the top 20 or so uh, rules that people are using. Let's just make that be point and click functionality in Avi. It shouldn't take any scripting, shouldn't take any complexity. With something as basic as something like uh, HTTP to HTTPS, since I'm on that subject, go in and edit my virtual service. And I'm using this system HTTP. Uh, but with something like this, we can just go and uh, set up a new help, uh, HTTP profile. And there's just an SSL everywhere checkbox. And this says redirect from HTTP to HTTPS, encrypt my cookies, provide strict transport security all the way down the line. Wow, Avi has a lot of great stuff built right into the UI. But what about the last mile of customization? We don't expect everything to be straightforward and simple and nice and easy, happy-go-lucky. If you need to, then we can get in and we can script. Um, Avi does have something called DataScript, which is our data plane scripting language. And with DataScript, this allows us to do very much similar to iRules, where we script out whatever functionality is that you require. We've got lots of examples on uh, GitHub as well as our docs page, obvinetworks.com slash docs. And we, uh, for our data script, we're using Lua as the scripting language, which is pretty similar to Tickle except 25 years newer, fewer squiggly brackets. And uh, with that, it's, it's pretty much accomplishing the same, the same concept. So we go over to data scripts and we write, create, et cetera, a new data script and just go and step a new one. Uh, HPS, HPS redirect here's a very simple one that we could go and modify or we could go and just write a new one. And basically it's gonna look exactly like what you've seen before. With DataScript, it, it's conceptually the same idea. It's just a different scripting language. Uh, Lua is a lot newer by literally 25 years newer. And with this, it's a little more C-like. And that means that it's computationally much, much less expensive. And memory wise, it's much, much less expensive. So it's dramatically more scalable. Now it's still not C. So our goal is always that you should be able to do something like point and click, something like a redirect, 
do that point and click in the in the um, HTTP profile, for instance, and you'll redirect me HTTP to HTTPS. For something like, uh, if you need a little bit more functionality, then you go into the policies, it gives you more capability. And if you need to go further than that, then we get into data script and we start scripting it out. It would appear RV is definitely designed for both now and the future of application delivery. You may be asking if it can handle legacy applications. Are there any considerations around migrating older applications? When we talk about legacy applications, the legacy application is listening on a port, it's responding, we send it a health check. So, you know, yes, we have the basic health checks to, you know, to do what you need to do. We can snap, we can do routing instead. We can do all of the, the basic constructs to be able to provide layer four, layer seven load balancing. So you'd be surprised at how seldom it really, really matters. The majority of all applications, though, they have no issues and don't, don't in the least bit mind being moved into a, towards a software-defined uh, architecture, uh, fully distributed, fully active. They don't know. They don't care. They're, it's, it's agnostic to them. Uh, and so there's very seldom where you really see any kind of an issue like that. Um, and that's pretty important. Now, there are some things like you can take an application from that kind of first or second generation of an application and move it into microservices, move it into containers, and then the requirements do change and become a little more interesting. Uh, not a problem. But uh, most applications, so if you just take your existing applications and the question, can I take a legacy app and throw Avi in front of it and then move from a kind of a brick and mortar, kind of a big iron uh, load balancing and then move into a distributed distributed elastic fabric, the applications don't know and don't care. Well, it sounds like RV has taken measures to make the migration path easy for each customer, and they're there to help. Once migrated, what is a big shift that customers have to get used to when managing or troubleshooting their load balancers for application delivery? And how does this look when doing traffic captures? Let's see an example as Nathan shows scaling up from two load balancers to four. What this means is that if I'm running on two or three and then midway through this traffic capture, I scale out and now I'm running on four service engines or four load balancers. The traffic capture is running on all load balancers that are servicing this application. They're all going to send the results back to the controller. The controller will normalize this into a single PCAP and say, here is the results distributed across all of my data plane on the client side, on the server side, et cetera. So you're not really having to think about this from a mentality of which load balancer is which application running on at this point in time. Uh, you can see that information, but if I go in and click scale out, I'm running on two. If we do things like go into the logs, so logs will tell us this particular uh, connection, request, whatever the transaction is, it was executed on this particular service engine. So all of that information is there, but for the most part, what you're going to find is it takes a little while to get over this paradigm, but very quickly once you do, you really will never think about load balancers, again, as an entity or a device. It's just a fabric. It's just a service that you're providing. You're providing application delivery as a service inside of your infrastructure. How big, small that is, that's just a, a function of the license. If you need double, quadruple it, it just it needs, it grows, it shrinks. As enterprises look to modernize their infrastructure and their application workloads, they're also trying to modernize the way that they run from an operational standpoint. It takes time and resources to make the move. But can you still automate without necessarily having to forklift an entire configuration all at one time? RV works to make it as simple as possible for customers to adopt migration and automation strategies. Let's see what Nathan has to say. So as part of this process, we can do things like migrate an application over, test it out, validate it, migrate the next app, and do this in batches. Uh, a really important piece here is that that kind of gets overlooked a little bit is a lot of times people look at this as I have to do a lift and shift. I'm going to take this load balancer and it's 1,000 virtual services, drop it onto Avi and hope it works. Don't do that. You can, but don't do that. The, uh, that just, you're making your life a whole lot harder than you need to. You can do an application at a time or groups of applications at a time. Let the application teams validate it. If everything is good, then the next batch goes. Okay, we can automate this in lots of ways. 
um, super important is it's just it's not something where it has to be an all or nothing. Shifting to a modern software designed load balancer to deliver your applications may seem daunting, but RV has helped enterprises migrate a large number of deployments. Once you get up and running with RV, what does this mean for your operation and management of the system? Our goal is to make RV as easy as possible. That has always been our philosophy, is to make RV be streamlined, smooth, etc. Um, for instance, uh, uh, as part of uh, if you're exploring Avi, whether you're a customer or not, uh, you have access to our training. So you can go to avinetworks.com slash workshops. And we've got uh, workshops that are scheduled pretty regularly. And these are uh, different, different lengths, from anywhere from one hour to multi-day. And they get in pretty hardcore, pretty technical. Uh, folks like myself uh, will run you through every detail about Avi and put you through some pretty good labs. And that's a great example, a great way to learn that these are these are just free trainings. Because our goal is that the, the more you understand Avi, the more you know it, the less complicated it becomes, the less you're relying on support, the less you're relying on, you know, a third party tooling, the more that you really understand Avi, the happier you are. And that's that's really what it comes down to. That's part of that whole white glove experience, which is what Avi is all about. Well, that's a pretty good wrap up of key migration points from legacy hardware based systems to software design load balancing with RV. I hope this episode has provided you with a better understanding of how RV can automate common application delivery tasks and simplify your day to day operations. As always, for more information, you can log on to rvnetworks.com forward slash webinars. You can also take some VMware workshops on load balancing by visiting rvnetworks.com forward slash workshops. Thank you for joining me. I am your host, Mark Jeffries, and I'll see you soon for the next episode of LBTV.